So, we are uh, continuing tonight this discussion about uh, creation. We spent uh, yesterday talking about uh, human evolution, taking one of the lessons uh, that's a part of this Apologetics Press uh, curriculum for uh, our Vacation Bible School and looking at that yesterday and just, just saw how when it comes to human, human evolution that the evidence does not, the evidence is not there. Uh, the evidence is just not available. And so tonight we're going to kind of broaden that discussion a little bit. And instead of just talking about human evolution, we're, we're, going, we're going to expand uh, this discussion. When you, when you think about evolution, and I mentioned this, mentioned this yesterday, when you think about evolution, there's different kinds of evolution, okay? Uh, there is microevolution. We mentioned this yesterday to talk about the fact that, you know, here, here's Jeff and Connor. You know, they are a lot alike, but Connor's thankful that they're not completely identically alike, right? You know, so microevolution indicates here's, here's a father-son, that there's a lot of similarities, but there's yet some micro changes that have taken place in the creation of a new one. When you think about dogs, dogs are dogs are dogs, right? And you say, no, dogs are, okay. But how many different types of dogs are there out there? Okay, I don't, when I was a kid, I don't remember anything about Labradoodles, okay? Um, but I mean, there's like everything doodle today, I, you know? When I was a kid, I, you know, I'd take a snickerdoodle or something, but forget these Labradoodles uh, you know, or whatever other, but how many other, how many different dogs are, what is, that's microevolution. Are, are they creating a new dog? Well, they're, they're, it's a different looking dog, right? But it's still a dog. Micro changes, that, so that's not what we're talking about. There's macro evolution. We talked about that in the human evolution yesterday. What's macro evolution? Macro evolution is the, is the idea, and you see his picture up here. Uh, you recognize this, uh, it's meant to be a little washed out there in the background, but uh, Darwin, Charles Darwin, helped to uh, popularize the idea, uh, his, his theory, that uh, there was that single cell organism that eventually evolved into a multi-cell organism that was much more complex, not microevolution from dog to dog, but macro from a, uh, from a small single cell organism all the way to these multi-cell, and we talked about that. But tonight what I want us to talk about is what's called cosmic evolution. And cosmic evolution involves the macroevolution uh, but it involves looking at the entire universe as a whole. And uh, looking tonight particularly uh, at the idea of the Big Bang. And uh, is the Big Bang sufficient evidence for the origin of our universe? And uh, I know you know the answer to that, and I know uh, you can add some things uh, to this as we go, but that's, that's, that's where we're headed tonight, is to talk about the Big Bang. Now... My guess is, my guess is that most of you do not believe in the Big Bang Theory, okay? Uh, so I'm going to kind of go a little bit out on that limb and suppose that most of you don't believe in the Big Bang Theory. Here's what's happened, though. Um, there have been some well-meaning individuals who believe in creation. They believe that God created the world, but they have been so inundated with this concept of evolution. They have been so pounded by this idea of the Big Bang Theory. They have, been, they have felt like they've been forced to accept it. And so what some have done is said, well, I believe in creation, but I believe in the Big Bang too. Can you take creation as we read about it in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, and can you take the Big Bang and can you perform a marriage ceremony and bring them together and, and, and pronounce them husband and wife and that forever they lived happily ever after? Can you do that? Can creation and the Big Bang coexist and complement each other? Amazingly, some folks have tried to take the idea of evolution, this, uh, this the idea that we all started with this little speck uh, of nothing uh, that's smaller than a period on, on, on a printed page 13.8 billion years ago that exploded in a big bang and created all of this. Can that coincide, can that work with, at the same time, 
creation. So here is a, uh, and I know you may not be able to see a lot that's on here because the print is pretty small. But here's how they, here's how they um, put the Big Bang on a timeline, okay? So over here is that Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. Now, just let this sink in. How did they figure out 13.8 billion? Now, by the way, that number has grown over the years. It's had to expand to fit uh, their, their various ideas. But 13.8 billion years ago, there was a bang, a big bang. And at that moment, in less than a second uh, of time, this little cosmic egg expanded faster than the speed of light for a period of time, but then it stopped. Now, I want you to notice in here, uh, there are atoms that are formed. The first atoms are formed. Look at where the first atoms are formed. 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The first, the first atoms? Don't, now, how do you figure out 380,000 80, years, 80, years and not 365,000 years? But yet they say that's when, that's when the first atoms uh, were formed 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The first stars, where are the stars on here? Here are the stars, the stars and the galaxies form 300 million years later. 300 million years after the Big Bang, you have stars being formed. Now, let, think, think about the numbers here. Think about how they've tried to put this together. Now, look at where our you can't read that up there probably. It says solar system. Look at where our solar system is over here. It's way on out there after the Big Bang because things keep evolving. Things keep expanding. They keep growing. All right? So here's, I showed you a uh, kind of an evolutionary chart last night. Here's one from Apologetics Press uh, that shows this, this single cell organism over here, and you've got your... I guess that's a human, right? I don't know. Uh, over here. And, and you see the progression that takes place from this single cell. Or, by the way, this single cell organism, let me back up. This single cell organism doesn't come about until what? It's, it's not in existence until, uh, ju until just a few hundred million years ago. It's a long time after the Big Bang that that even comes into existence. So it takes millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, for the single cell to then progress to the point that it gets to become a plant, to the point that it becomes an invertebrate, then a vertebrate, uh, becomes the fish, becomes the amphibian, becomes the reptile, becomes the dinosaur, which becomes the birds, which becomes the mammals, which becomes the, the chimps, which becomes the humans. And the humans have only been around for about two or three million years years. We're kind of young, right? We haven't been on this. 13.8 billion years ago is when the Big Bang banged, and humans have only been around for about two or three million years. Now, if that's what's being taught, if that's the theory, can that fit in the Bible? Does that jive with creation. We're going to look at this verse more tomorrow night. Uh, we're going to talk about the age of the earth tomorrow night, uh, which I think is maybe one of the, maybe if not the, but it's, it's one of the most important topics we're going to talk about. But what did Moses say in, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11? For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that's in them. 13.8 billion years or six days. Can those two things go together? They don't fit together. They, they don't come anywhere close to fitting together. So you know what happened. You, you know Genesis chapter 1. I hope you know Genesis chapter 1. Do we need to sing the song? Day 1, day 1, God made light when there was none. We won't sing the song because you're looking at me funny. So day 1, God takes, what did God start with? What did he start with? He started with nothing, and he made everything. Hey, have you, have you, have you, you've heard the, uh, you've heard the story. Um, 
you've heard the story about someone trying to uh, tell God how they could create life and how they could create, you know, all of these great things. And so God said, great, let's have a competition. I, I will create life and you create life. I will create things and you create things. And so how did God make man? Out of the dust of the earth, right? So this, 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 this person that's challenging God goes and gets his pile of dust in order to create man. And the story goes that God said, oh, no, no, no. You go get your own pile of dirt. You go find your own. Well, what's the point there? You can't make, you can't make your own pile of dirt. God, God took nothing, created dirt, and then he created man. There's a whole lot of jokes there. Marshall Keeble used to talk about that uh, man was made out of dust and our bodies are uh, 90 something percent water and so what's man but a big mud ball uh, and uh, that's that's what we are but so day one God made light he, he takes he takes nothing and he starts to create something day two he creates the firmament uh, this idea of the expanse that is the separation of the waters in creation day three all of a sudden the water that's covering the earth has that dry land has the mountains that start to appear and the grass and the flowers and the vegetation starts to come into existence on day three. Day four, what's made? Day four, day four. Remember? Sun and moon and stars galore. That's how you remember it, folks. So day four, here you have all of the planets. Uh, here you have our solar system. Here's where you have all of the stars created by God. Day five, fish and fowl, fish and birds. Uh, all of these created, and they're, they, are, they are made according to their kind. Day six, you've got, you got land animals, you've got humans created according to their kind. Now, does this jive with the Big Bang Theory? Can, can we take the two concepts and can we put them together in some form to make them work? It doesn't fit in any way. Think about some of the differences, just, just a few, all right? Here's some of the problems if you try to combine the two. In Genesis chapter 1, you've got the, this earth, this formless earth that was created initially in Genesis 1 and verse 1, and it was created prior to the stars. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When do the stars come into play? Day four, day four, sun and moon and stars galore. On the fourth day, you've got stars. But if we back up to that timeline for the Big Bang, the stars were in existence billions of years before the earth was. Those two things don't line up. You, 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 can't, you can't have both. According to the Bible, the earth was initially covered with water in Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 and 6. And yet... Evolution argues that the earth was initially molten. Is that the same thing? Water? Molten? That's not the same thing. Big Bang would tell you that the sun was formed 3.9 billion years before the first land plants, before the first plants were ever on the earth. So they say the sun came 3.9 billion years before the plants. Okay. In Genesis chapter 1, on what day were the plants created? Day 3. When was the sun created? Day 4. It's not, the, it's not even in the right order. It's in completely the wrong order. By the way, there are those who would teach the, uh, the gap theory, the day-age theory, uh, either one of those that, that would teach you that, um, that the days of creation, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow night, so I don't want to get too far into it, but they would try to convince you that the days of creation were not 24-hour days. Uh, but instead, they were long periods of time, maybe a thousand years, maybe a million years long. Well, if the, if the daylight time was a thousand years long, then how long did the night time have to be in between the days? If it was a million years long, how long did the night darkness have to be in between the days? Could plants survive in a thousand years of darkness, in a million years of darkness? It just, you know, none of that makes sense. Do plants require pollination from some flying critters? Yeah, except plants came in on day three. Those flying critters came two days later. Could plants survive for eons of time without their pollinators to come and to take care of them? 
The Big Bang says that fish preceded the fruit trees by hundreds of millions of years, but the Bible teaches that the fruit trees were created two days before the fish. And then the final example is that evolution claims that birds evolved from dinosaurs. I just want you to think about that. Big old huge dinosaurs evolved into birds. In creation, when did the birds come? When did the dinosaurs come? Birds, day five. Dinosaurs, land creatures, day six. So is it possible to take the Big Bang theory and creation and bring them together and say, well, I believe in God, I believe in creation, but I, you know, I, 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 I kind of believe in the Big Bang too. Can you have both? You can't, you can't, you, it, you can't have anything like bo having both. They, they are completely contrary to each other. Uh, so that's, that's kind of point number one, and what we're looking at tonight is you've got to pick one. You, you've, you've got to pick which one you're going to follow and which one you're going to believe. So there may be other individuals who would try to convince you that uh, Genesis chapter 1 is just kind of figurative. The, this whole story about God creating uh, the world in six days, it, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, symbolic, they might say, or, or kind of mythical. It's not to be, what they want you to believe is don't take it literally. Don't take day one literally. Don't take day two literally. Don't take the, the day three in the mountains literally. Don't take sun, moon, and stars galore literally. It's, it's, it's God being figurative and symbolic in the beginning. Do you have any indication when you read Genesis chapter one that it's not literal? Do you have any indication there that he, God's using figurative, symbolic language? Do you, do you see any other figurative language anywhere else in the book of Genesis? Is, 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 is Genesis just all symbolic and myths? When you go to the New Testament, how did New Testament people, how did New Testament writers consider things in the book of Genesis? Did they think that Genesis was literal, real stuff, or figurative? Think, think, about, think about some examples. In James chapter 2, James writes about the time that Abraham took his son Isaac to sacrifice him. Did James believe that was a real event, or did he just believe that was symbolic and, and just a, a myth? That's part of Genesis. And James looked at Genesis and said, what I'm reading in the book of Genesis is real. When you read the little book of Jude, he talks about various individuals and events that are described in Genesis, and he talks about them as being real. You read the book, the, the writings of the Apostle John. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12, he's talking about Cain. You remember Cain? Where's Cain? All the way back to the beginning of the book of Genesis. Did John believe that Cain was a real Bible character? He did. You read uh, the book of Hebrews. Huh. How often in the book of Hebrews do you read about Old Testament individuals and events? Like in every chapter? It's being written to the Hebrews, being written to Christians who had a Jewish background, who believed in the Old Testament. What, what does Hebrews chapter 11 talk about? Who's in Hebrews chapter 11? Great heroes of faith. Any of them from the book of Genesis? So did, 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 did he look at Genesis as some kind of myth, some kind of uh, fairy tale that is just to kind of make us feel good? No, Hebrews didn't. What about Peter? In both 1 Peter and 2 Peter, uh, he talks about people from Genesis. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6, he talks about Sarah. Chap in chapter 3 and verse 20, he talks about Noah. He talks about Noah over here in chapter 2. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah over in chapter... All of that, what book of the Bible is all that in? The book of Genesis. What, what's the point with all of this? The point is that if some people are going to try to tell you that Genesis chapter 1 is just myth and symbolic... Well, why would chapter 1 be that, but not the rest of the book? Here's New Testament people say, nope, it's real. Paul, same thing. Uh, did, did Paul take Satan to be real or just a myth? Did Paul write about, Peter write about Satan? Is that just a myth? And uh, I don't know if it made this list up here. It's not all up here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3 talks about when Satan deceived Eve. 
That's in chapter 3 of Genesis. Did, was that real? Yeah, that was real. It wasn't a myth. It wasn't symbolic. What about uh, the genealogies of Jesus? Do they talk about real people from the book of Genesis? What about Jesus? Did Jesus talk about Old Testament characters and events like they really happened? From the book, from the book of Genesis. Think about your history in the book of Genesis. Did Jesus ever talk about Noah? He did. As we're in the days of Noah, so shall be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Did Jesus ever talk about Abraham? Before Abraham was, uh, I am. Did he ever talk about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? He talked about Sodom. When he, when, he, when he looked at Bethsaida and Chorazin and said, you know, you're, you're, the day of judgment is going to be more tolerable for Sodom than for you. He's talking about things from, from, from the book of Genesis that Jesus said were absolutely real. What's the point? The point is you can't take, you can't take chapter 1 and just isolate, well, that's just kind of a myth, and then say the rest of it's literal. Now, did Jesus ever look back in Genesis chapter 1? When Jesus, and we'll, we'll talk more about this tomorrow night, did Jesus look at creation did he ever talk about God creating them male and female? He looked all the, was that, was that figurative? God creating male and female, was that figurative? A myth? Symbolic language? Or was that real? No, it's, it's all very real. So again, should I take Genesis and Big Bang and try to make them fit together? No, they won't fit together. Okay, well, well then what do I do? Oh, well, I just say Genesis chapter 1 is just kind of figurative and symbolic. no. Uh, it's, not, it's not figurative or symbolic, and so here's what you've got to decide. You've got to pick. Either the world came about, the universe came about on its own. It either created itself in natural ways, is that possible? Think through that. Or it didn't come about on its own, and it came about in some supernatural way, created by an all-powerful God. You, you can't have both, so you've got to pick which one. And when you try to pick which one, here's what you've got to do. And scientists, this is even a goal of science. In order to be rational, a person should only accept as true those things that the evidence proves. Now, I know being rational today is not the end thing, maybe. You're going to be rational. What does it mean to be rational? It means to examine the evidence, say, okay, here's the evidence. I'm only going to accept what this evidence proves and what it warrants. There was a time, hmm, there was a time when that was a goal of science. What's the scientific method all about? Observation. We, 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 we craft this idea, this high, is it called a hypotenuse? You craft, hypothesis. Hypotenuse is, is, ge is, is geometry. I, I got those classes confused in school. So there's this hypothesis that they create. And now we're going to test this. And how are we going to see if this is true? By observation, by only accepting that which has evidence behind it. Hmm. I know this may not be a popular thing to say, but when, when, I, when I hear today people saying, follow the science, that makes me a little uneasy because I'm not sure what science they're talking about. Um, because science used to be, let's look for the evidence, let's, look, let's observe some things that can be proven to be true. Now, does the Bible demand this of us? Does the Bible demand us to accept only that which we can observe to be true? What, what does God tell us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Test all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. God says you need to test. Make sure that what you believe and what you're following is absolute truth. So, we're not going to have time to get through all of these because we've got 16 and a half minutes. Um, but in the, uh, in the material that uh, the Apologetics Press gave for this lesson. They gave eight big problems with the Big Bang. I might be able to get through the first two and then we're just probably just gonna skip past the last one because we won't have time to get it. But 
There's, there's more here on these first two that I think we need to grab a hold of. But uh, if you get in a conversation with somebody about the Big Bang, here's eight big problems with the Big Bang. Number one problem is the problem of the origin of the laws of science. Where did the laws of nature come from? Where did the laws of science come from? Did they write themselves? Could they write themselves? Laws of nature, laws of science. Can they write themselves? Did they create themselves? Or did somebody have to put them into action? And so what some scientists have done over these last few years is they've, they've kind of felt themselves backed into a corner on these laws of science where they're saying, well, how, do we, how, do we, how do we say that, you know, these weren't created, that these kind of wrote, them, they wrote themselves and they haven't been able to come up with a good answer. And so you, you might think this is kind of like only movie or Hollywood or comic book uh, worthy, but they have come up with this idea of the multiverse. I don't know why, because here's their deal. They're having trouble explaining the universe. They're having trouble explaining the origin of the universe, and they're having trouble explaining the laws by which our universe operates. And so since they can't explain the origin of these laws, what they do they magnify their problem by talking about the multiverse. Well, guess what? How are you going to prove the multiverse? How are you going to prove the, the evidence for a multiverse? How are you going to prove what laws there are that even govern the multiverse? And by the way, if you get in a discussion with anybody about this, you know how many universes there are? Uno. There's, there's one universe. You know how much evidence there is for a multiverse? Unless you're watching a movie somewhere. You know how much evidence there is? There is no, they've made it up. And they've made it up in an attempt to get away from having to explain the laws of nature. The laws of, and I don't see how it helps them. To me, it, it, it hurts them. And so advocating the existence of a multiverse does not explain the, uh, the origin of the laws of nature. And they admit that it doesn't. So they've just kind of backed away from it. Advocating the existence of the multiverse, it actually complicates their position. Because now you've got to figure out, all right, what about the multiverse? Where did it come from? And what about the laws that are supposed to be governing it? It advocates for something for which there cannot ever be any evidence. And you read their writings, and they will even admit <laughs> there's no evidence and there can't be any evidence for the multiverse, but they keep talking about it. How can you talk about something that doesn't exist and you don't, you say there's never going to be evidence to, I, I, that just, that it, it, it just boggles the mind how far people will go to get away from God, to get away from any concept uh, of there being a God who has created uh, the universe. And so if they were, the, the advocating of, of the multiverse, would be an admission by the naturalist, but that there's something beyond the natural. They're saying there's something else out there that's not natural. Well, where did it come from? It'd have to come from some kind of supernatural place, wouldn't it? So here's, here's, their, here's their deal. You, you know this guy? You know, you've heard of Stephen Hawking? Uh, interesting, it's interesting what a champion for this whole cause this man was and has become. Um, but if you read some of his writings, uh, he did, he did, uh, he did a, a show on the Discovery Channel, and this is where these next two quotes come from. I, just want, I, want to, I want you to let these things sink in, because he was talking about the laws of nature, and how, you know, where do the laws of nature, where do these laws of science come from? So here's what Steve, Stephen Hawking says. The universe is a machine. Think about his words. Is a machine governed by principles or laws? Hmm. Yeah, it is. Okay. Laws that can be understood by the human mind. I believe that the discovery of these laws has been humankind's greatest achievement. But what's really important is that these physical laws, as well as being unchangeable, are universal. They apply not just to the flight of the ball, but to the motion of a planet and everything else in the universe. Unlike laws made by humans, Unlike laws made by humans. Well, who are these laws made by? The laws of nature 
cannot ever be broken. That's why they're so powerful. Here's a man trying to explain the laws of nature. And what's he admitting? These things are powerful. These things are unchangeable. These things cannot be broken. These things were not made by humans. Hmm, okay then. Then where'd they come from? Later on in this episode, he said, think about this. Did God create the quantum laws that allowed the Big Bang to occur? In a nutshell, did we need a God to set it all up so that the Big Bang could bang? What's he asking? <laughs> he's asking, is there a God? He's asking, how does all of this happen? He's, he, he is admitting, okay, here's this Big Bang, but how did the Big Bang bang? We don't know. Here's their champion. Here's their champion who said, did God create these? And of course he doesn't believe that, but he says, how could all of this occur? So, I know you've heard of Stephen Hawking. Perhaps you've heard of Paul Davies, who is an atheistic, theoretical physicist, cosmologist. Uh, he is an astrobiologist over at the Arizona State University. And he looked at what Hawking said in here. He realized that Hawking was kind of sidestepping the question and not answering it. So here, here's what Davies said. He said, well, uh, no, he said, Stephen Hawking gets very, very close. Stephen Hawking gets very, very close to saying, well, where did the laws of physics come from? That's where we might find some sort of God. Davies doesn't believe in God, but he's saying by, by Hawking asking that question, he's saying, hmm, did they come from God? But no, he couldn't be saying that. And then he backs, he says about Hawking, he backs away and doesn't return to the subject. And then Davies says, you need to know where those laws come from. That's where the mystery lies, the laws. Huh. You need, he doesn't believe in God, but he knows these laws of science exist. And he says, you need to know where they come from. And he says, that's the mystery. Remember last night we had some quotes where they were also talking about human evolution being a mystery. <laughs> What are they admitting? We don't have any evidence for this. Can't prove any of it. We're just making this up as we go. And the mystery is, where did these laws come from? You want a problem, a big problem for the Big Bang? It's the origin of the laws of science. Naturalists um, have no explanation at all, because they don't have any evidence, for how the laws of science could come into existence in a natural way. They cannot explain them. And we just saw Hawking and Davies say, we can't explain this in a natural way. Okay, then where did they come from? They said they didn't come from humans. Where did the laws of nature come from? These are the folks who are following a blind faith because they have nothing upon which to stand. So big problem number one for the Big Bang is the origin of the laws of nature. Now, Next to that, along with that, uh, is the problem of the origin of matter and energy. All right? Don't get lost in all of this. Um, try, 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 to, try to stay with me on what we're talking about. So, before the Big Bang could bang, there had to be some physical material to bang together, right? So... The question is, there's only two possibilities there for, for them. That, for, for them, not only two possibilities, but, but for them to, to have this theory, they only have two possibilities. Either that material was eternal, I mean, it's just always been here, or it created itself. Let's think about this. Was it eternal, or did it create itself? So, Big Bang model, here's what they claim is that the universe began with all matter and energy in one place, that little speck smaller than a period on a printed page. So all of the matter of everything that we know was in that little thing smaller than a period, and then it rapidly expanded in less than a second forming the universe. You've seen explosions on TV, right? Hopefully you've never seen them in real life. But you've seen explosions on TV, right? Explosions create order, right? They take something that was absolutely chaotic and it creates nice, beautiful order every time, right? No, it doesn't. All right, so, but let's just go along with this, okay? Great. There was this, there was this little this matter and this energy. It was already in existence. Fantastic. Where did it come from? 
just grant, grant it to them and ask, where did it come from? And with, if, when, you, when you don't have God in the equation, you only have two possibilities. It was either eternally, it's always been around, or it created itself. Now, we're going to take both of those options away from them. No, we're not. The laws of science are going to take both of those laws away from them. There's people who, who believe in the Big Bang Theory who, uh, who say that, the matter, that uh, the matter that's in the universe was the result of a quantum fluctuation where energy transformed into the universe's matter. Okay, well, what caused that to happen? I mean, just keep asking the questions. Where did that come from? Only two possibilities. So here, here's what we're going to do. We've got five minutes. We're going to deal, deal with this stuff in five, hopefully less than five minutes. Um, three relevant laws of science that take their naturalistic view of the origin of, uh, of the universe and completely demolish it, okay? Nicole's counting. Uh, okay, so uh, well, I, we'll count for you on the screen, Nicole, okay? So, three, three relevant laws of science that look at this, oh, well, we had matter and energy and it's always been here, it's eternal, or it created itself or whatever. Okay, so, you know these things, all right? Number one, first law of thermodynamics. What is the first law of thermodynamics? First law of thermodynamics indicates that in nature, matter and energy do not create themselves from nothing. Hang on a second. What's a scientific law? How does something become a law? Something that cannot be argued. Happens the same every time. No exceptions. It's pretty hard to become a scientific law, isn't it? I mean, you know, when... when uh, Mr. Smith, was it Mr. Smith went to Washington, you know, and the, something becomes a bill? I mean, that, that, that's, that's a pretty complicated process. But to become a law of science, I mean, that's really tough. All right, so here's a law of science. First law of thermodynamics. Matter and energy do not create themselves from nothing. Energy can be converted into matter, and vice versa, but the same total amount of matter and energy in the universe must remain constant. Either matter and energy in the natural realm were created by something out of the natural realm, or that matter and energy had to be eternal. But could it be? Matter and energy do not create themselves from nothing. Okay, so what, what were the two possibilities? If this matter energy, it was there 13.8 billion years ago to bang together, possibility number one was that it created itself. What does first law of thermodynamics say? Nope. Nope, it didn't. Not a chance that that matter and energy created itself. Otherwise, first law of thermodynamics falls apart, but we know that that's a law. So, no, we've taken that option away from them. Second law of thermodynamics. What is that? Second law of thermodynamics. You may remember the word entropy, right? Entropy happens. What does that mean? We are steadily running out of usable energy. And you're like, yes, I am. It's about 8 o'clock right now. I'm steadily running out of you. No, 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 not talking about you. Talking about the universe. Uh, we are, the universe is wearing out and running down. And you're like, yes, I am. Okay, we're not talking about you. Uh, but yes, we are, right? So implying that it could not have existed forever. If the world is running down, if the world is running out of useful energy, if the world is wearing out, what does that indicate about where it came from? Is it eternal? When, when you, when you uh, did y'all ever have those tops? Y'all ever play with those? It was, it was called a top, right? Y'all ever have one of those things that, you, that, that had like a, a, a thing on the top and you pulled it up and you pushed? It was like a, a little, what was that thing? Like a pump. It was like a pump, but it was a, you know, so, but did y'all have one of those, you pick up, and, and you watch that thing spin, and spin, and spin, and spin, you know, but then, did it ever wear out, ever run down, what happened, and then it collapsed and fell over, and then you picked it back up, what does running down and wearing out indicate, there was a beginning, right, here's the, and, and science, uh, all scientists say, no, our universe is wearing out, it's running down, what does that tell you, does that allow for the fact that it is eternal, it cannot be eternal if it's running down and wearing out. So we've taken their two options away from them. Last thing, last law here real quick. The law of causality. What does the law of causality say? Every effect that we see in the natural realm always has a cause. 
Every single effect, material effect, always has a cause. And since the universe is an effect, it requires a cause. Matter and energy could not have existed forever. Matter and energy could not have created themselves. There must have been a cause that caused the matter, the matter and the energy to come into existence. They didn't create themselves. They are not eternal because scientific laws take them. You notice we're not talking about Bible here. We're not talking about Scripture to disprove the Big Bang. We're using their own scientific information to prove that their theories are absolutely false when it comes to the origin of the universe. Cosmic evolution has no bearings, has no uh, evidence to support it at all. And I told you we were only going to get through two. Number three, the inflation problem. You can go on the Apologetics website and just look up all of these things. The, the inflation problem, the dark energy problem, where it's funny. They've made up that 73% that of our universe is 73% of our universe is made up of dark energy, except you can't see it, you can't, you can't, you can't know it's there. You, it's, you just, you don't even, they've just made it up to try to explain away uh, some, some, uh, some of the things that are happening in the universe. The smoothness problem, the idea that in, 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 uh, in the Big Bang you would expect everything to be smooth and yet it's not uh, in the universe. The antimatter problem, when matter is created, it's supposed to, it creates antimatter at the same time. Well, where's all the antimatter if, uh, if that's how it's, I mean, it's not there? Uh, the Fermi paradox uh, is, uh, and, and then the, the anthropic principle. They look some of these things, and it's interesting how they put these little QR codes. They did all of that uh, on the side there. But go, go, to, go to their website. Uh, you can look all of this stuff up, and uh, it's, does the Big Bang have problems? Yeah. It's got a lot of big problems. Um, are you like, want, oh, I thought you were wanting to say something. Oh, okay. All right. I, and it, Nicole's always got that look like, I just want to jump in. Um, so to be rational, what do you have to do? Only accept that which has the evidence to support it. Does the Big Bang have any evidence? Not a bit. And, and, and you just look at some of the simple, you learned about first and second law of thermodynamics in school. I mean, you take these simple laws, you say, no, 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 this, this doesn't work. It doesn't follow, and it can't fit in the Bible. Why don't we just pick up the Bible and say, this is from God. It bears the evidence that it is from God, and believe what the Bible tells us about our origin. We should never be ashamed to say that's where we came from that God made me. There is abundant evidence for that. And if you're going to be rational, accept the evidence that is there staring us literally in our face because our face is evidence that we've been created by God. One more reminder to our gentlemen. We need some help down the hallway, if you would, getting some tables and chairs set up. You all are dismissed.